Today is Thursday, May 17th, 2018, and my name is Scott Henshaw. I am at the home of University Archivist Emerita Betty Carter to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to start the interview by asking you about your background. Can you tell me when and where you were born? Yes, I was born in Mooresville, North Carolina, August 5th, 1941. Mooresville today is known as being the home of Lake Norman, but when I was there, it's just a country, little country town. Mm -hmm. Okay, and can you tell me about your family and home life? Uh, I have one brother. My parents uh, were married in 1931. The, and the first, at first, they lived in northern Mecklenburg County. Right after they married, they lived on a farm. I don't know whether they were tenant farmers, um, just a farmhand, or, or, or how that worked. But sharecropping, I don't know. But they did that for like two or three years. They eventually moved to Rowan County, about 1938. And my dad went to work for Cannon Mills. Cannon Mills is a huge textile factory. Yeah, that, he was part of the, that group of people who moved from the farms to the towns in the 30s, the 20s, 30s, and 40s. He get, I mean, they realized they could not make any money or a living growing cotton. Right. So they moved in, even though it was low wages, at least it was sure wages. And so my dad worked in the slasher room uh, hot, hard work, labor, and he worked there until he retired in the early 70s. My mother was a stay-at-home mom. They had a huge garden, and my dad even grew cotton on his farm. We had, mm -hmm. He had about 15 acres, and I still own most of that property. Wow. I, I couldn't let, that was his, I can't let it go. Yeah, he worked hard for that. Yep. Yeah. So that, that, it was out in the country, uh, since you mentioned Herman, I'll have to tell you a story. Is that okay? okay? Sure, of course. It took me a long, long time to admit that we were poor mm -hmm. out in the country. I mean, we had as much as everyone else, but compared to today's standards, we were poor. So I told Herman that one time, just within the last maybe 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And he said, Betty, he said, did you always have a house to live in? I said, yeah. He said, do you always have a place to sleep at night? I said, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you have food to eat? Yes. He said, you weren't poor. Yeah. yeah that's it's all in the perspective. Perspective, that's what yes, I was going to say. Yes, as you yeah. know. So, but um, that, it was, um, I guess we didn't have a lot of money, but everything went well mm -hmm. out in the country. You didn't really want for anything. No. So, yeah. No. That's good. Um, what high school did you attend? Landis High School. Okay. Landis was a little town about five miles from my home. And the whole, I went there grades one through 12. Okay, yeah. Landis eventually consolidated with China Grove okay. High School and it is now called South Rowan. All right. Uh, my mother always, um, well first of all, neither of my parents graduated from high school. Sure. Uh, Mama, truly went to a one-room schoolhouse uphill both ways walking as you mm -hmm. know. And I can remember my dad telling me that this, he, they went, he went to various schools and he said that uh, in the spring they always had to leave school early because they had to get out and plant the cotton. Mm -hmm. In fall they always went to school late because they couldn't go to school until all the cotton was picked. Yeah. But I, Mama t kept telling me how fortunate I was to be able to ride a bus to school. Yeah. And she kept saying, you must graduate from high school. I know today high school is, I mean, everybody graduates from high school. Mm -hmm. That wasn't true in those days. Right. But she said, you graduate from high school and then get something else after high school. She never did say what that something else was, but she, she did not want me working, or my brother working in the mill. Mm -hmm. Right, that's but, very good. Did you have any favorite subjects in high school? You know, I've thought about that. I'm not sure I did. Okay. I was not the science, uh, science math person. Mm -hmm. I was more history English type. Sure. And also, I started taking piano lessons when I was in the second grade. Hmm. Wow. And music was always part of my life from very early. Yeah. I played for the glee club, I, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. 
But no, I, I'm not sure I had a um, favorite talk, subject. I enjoyed it all, in all honesty. Yeah, that's good. Um, so you said your mother didn't, said you had to go to, co to uh, high school and graduate and then something, something else. else. So what was the something else? Did you go I, straight I to college or? Oh, I have a very checkered life after, okay. the, after high school. Okay, let me just say first, Bobby, my husband and I were married right after high school. Okay. And that's shocking. My son still can't get over that, that we married so young. It was stupid, but it worked, so. Yeah. Uh, and so, in, I graduated from high school in 59. Remember this? This is, the de this is the time when the community college system in North Carolina had just been started. Mm -hmm. So you had a lot of little independent business colleges. Okay. And that's where my mother thought I should work in an office. Right. And um, so... Um, Which was not unusual at that no, time. No, it was, was nice, clean, yeah. easier work than working in the sure. mill. Yeah. That's the whole point. And so Bobby and I went to King's College in Charlotte. It was a business college. Mm -hmm. yeah. We immediately uh, from high school went to there, stayed there for 18 months. Uh, Bobby took accounting. I took secretary type stuff. I can type 100 words a minute. Yeah. And I can do shorthand 130 words a minute. So that's what I learned to do with accounting too. I'm not sure you want me to go on about it. Shall I just continue my trek through college? Yeah, I think that's a good okay. thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what happened is, I guess it's sort of like it is today. The the four year colleges would not accept any. You, you could not get a degree from from the business colleges. You mm -hmm. had to go to a four year college, and a lot of four year colleges would not accept the subjects that you had at the business mm -hmm. college. Sort of like today, you know, you get from the community college subjects except in four year college. I think is easier now than it used to be. But anyway, Bobby decided he wanted a degree. Mm -hmm. The only place around that would accept the courses that he had taken at King's was a school in Bowling Green, Kentucky. It is now connected to Western Kentucky University. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so we moved through Kentucky. I worked as a secretary and while Bobby went to school and supported us, with the, we lived in an apartment. Mm -hmm. And so um, I had completed the work at um, Kings, and so Bobby got his degree in Kentucky, and so I decided I wanted to go to college too, a real college. So Bobby went, was hired by the IRS, and we moved to Raleigh, and I went to Meredith. Mm -hmm. all right, all right. So again, you, here you run up against what I'm going to major in. Well, they wouldn't accept any of my business courses, and so I didn't want to retake them. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the debate was between history and English, and so I did away with English, and so I majored in history. But the, on the side, too, I was really thinking about piano, organ, particularly. But the, what balanced it toward history was the IRS had a tendency to move people around. Right. And so from town to town, I figured it would be easier for me to get a job teaching history than it would be to find a church that needed an organist. Right. So my major was history at Meredith. And then after Meredith, I went to Duke and got a master's in history. Okay. Uh, so when did you start to think about becoming an archivist, or did you... Uh, Never even, heard of being an archivist. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm sorry, Scott. No. It was, that happens uh, a lot, I think. <laughs> you know, I went to Duke, uh, uh, graduated from Meredith in 66, I went to Duke in 66, and so completed all the coursework by 67. I did not had not done my thesis and, at that time. So the summer of 67, somehow, and I, I have tried my best to know, think about this. I don't know how I heard about the job within the state archives, not NC State, the state of North Carolina mm -hmm. archives. But somehow I heard there were the two jobs there. And why, it, maybe they advertised it in the paper, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I applied for a job at the state archives and got it. And that's, so I really started thinking about being an archivist in the 1967 when right. I needed a job. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I, that still happens today. I think, and I yeah. fell in love with it. Yeah. I still remember the first collection of process. I, they have a huge uh, private collection, manuscript collection there, in addition to state 
records and county records. And mm -hmm. So I was in the private manuscript area. Loved it. Patterson Family Papers. Yeah. Still remember. Still remember it. Yeah. And how long were you at the uh, State Archives? I was there from 67 to 71. Okay, and then what happened after that? In 71, Bobby was transferred to Greensboro with okay. the IRS. So not too far. Well, no, not too far, bro. And it was very a long ways from the yeah, state archives. Yeah, you don't know. Want to commute there. Yeah. You know, so I had already um, tried. To, I had visited Bill Moore at the, North, uh, the Greensboro Historical Museum, mm -hmm. and fortunately, Dr. Thompson, who was director of Jackson, did. Do you do remember him? I can't remember when you he came. He was gone before I okay. even started, I think, as an undergraduate. So, okay, yeah. so Dr. Jackson was, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Jackson was gone too. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Thompson was there. And so Dr. Thompson knew my supervisor in Raleigh. So Dr. Mr. Coker in Raleigh referred mm -hmm. me to Dr. Jackson. I'm still saying it wrong, Dr. Thompson. So um, I had visited UNCG. Doctor, talk to Dr. Thompson, talk to Emmy. Emmy Mills, did you know Emmy? I can't remember. She was there during the time that I was an undergraduate, but I did okay. not work there at that time. Yeah. So I, that's when I first met them in, in, in 1971. Mm -hmm. they, they knew that they needed an archivist, and they knew that I had the qualifications to do the job, but budget didn't mm -hmm. have anything. So I, I said I would keep in touch with them, and then I went with, to the IRS and got a general job with the IRS in mm -hmm. the fall of 71. And so finally, in the late 1973, Emmy and I kept in touch. I don't think I ever talked to Dr. Thompson again, but Emmy and I kept in touch. Fall of 73, there was money was going to be okay. in the next year's budget, and they were going to have... Um, money for an archivist position, except it was going to be called library assistant. Mm, all right. And so I took a pay cut from the IRS to go back to UNCG, or go right. to UNCG. Right. The other thing that threw it sort of out of kilter, I was seven months pregnant mm -hmm. with Christopher, February 1st when I started there. So. Right. But, but that's, no, that's how fine. I got there. <laughs> so, um, what were your first impressions of UNCG as a school and campus? What did I it can't remember anything that really struck. I mean, I was I'd been to Meredith recently. Mm -hmm. I had taken courses on NC State, huge place. Mm -hmm. Had taken, you know, I'd been to Duke, huge place. It was just, you know, it was another. I really, I guess, in many cases, I. I, I, I've tried to think about that so after I saw your question. I don't remember thinking anything ba bad about it or good about it. And uh, I knew that, I realized that the papers that they had there in the archives were invaluable, though, because they had McKeever's papers going back to, you know, the beginning of the school. Sure. Boxes and boxes of them. Mm -hmm. So that part I was really interested in and thought, oh, okay. I can do this. Can you tell me about what kind of shape they were in? Had they ever been processed? No, or they had they... never been processed. Or they had been divided at one time. The what they call, thought were personal records actually gone, had gone to Maryland or somewhere with one of his with his daughter or mm. a, a relative. I can't remember. Sure. Uh, some of the others had stayed on campus. Now, they I, the personal things then eventually came back to campus. Now that those were still tied up in little packets. Mm -hmm. That was good. Yeah. I, I love that. Right. <laughs> no Re reason preserve for. original order. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that. I couldn't <laughs> do it. <laughs> so, uh, so we had the stuff that had stayed there, and we had a lot of the professional or, you know, his professional stuff, and the, then they had the personal stuff with him and Lula writing back and forth. So, mm -hmm. it was fantastic. And of course, the Faust papers were less valuable. Or I thought they were because they just weren't. They just didn't cover what McKeever had covered. Mm -hmm. I think in the beginning, it was so, I'm really straying off course here. Oh, no, it's fine. But McKeever's papers, I think in the very beginning, they realized that they were making history. Right. And you had Dr. Gove, who was very much in trying to keep the archives and some other people. And, and they just saved everything, mm -hmm. truly. Right. So that's one they, reason they had McKeever. a sense of what they were doing. Exactly. For sure. 
so can you talk about the department as it was at that time? <laughs> we talked about Emmy was there. Uh, was it you, just you and Emmy? Yep. Yeah. We were upstairs, the third floor in the cage. Now, has the cage wire been taken down? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. that's too bad. It was just Emmy and me. I um, worked some with Emmy with the special collections books, mm -hmm. and I worked some with the papers, and so it was. It was just uh, nothing was really organized how much time I would spend here or here. Right. We had two part-time retired librarians who came in like That's two right. afternoons a week. Wow. Marjorie Hood, who had mm -hmm. been in, do you, does that ring a bell? I know the name, yes. She had been in charge of circulation, or that's what it was called when she was there. And she actually lived practically on campus. Oh, really? okay. You know where Theta Street comes in now, is from, up from the, well, I won't go into that, but anyway. That's okay. She was with, just right across from Elliot Sandra. Right. And Miss Hood had been in charge of cataloging. No, that was Miss Hood. Miss Moose had been in charge mm -hmm. of cataloging, so she came in a couple of afternoons a week. And then we had student helpers, so it was just the Emmy and me. Right. That's. Um, <laughs> I can remember when and Emmy was still. She would get all these catalogs from rare book dealers, you know, and she'd go through and check with the ones that she wanted to add to the collection. And what we would do then, we I would go to the stacks. First of all, I would look up the call number. This remember, no no internet, nothing, this right. is all. So I would look up the call number and see if we had the book that she wanted, then I'd go out of the stacks and pull it. Mm -hmm. And then I'd take it upstairs and then me would go th do whatever needed to be done about processing it. Right, there were quite a few in the, in the general collection that oh, should yeah. have been. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, and that's why she got a lot of them. And yeah, we still some, get some that oh, way. Oh, do you really? Yeah, yeah, sometimes Mark Schumacher will come up with one, that, yeah. Yeah, or Carolyn maybe. Yeah, like yeah, that's in the beginning, that's why we got most of them. Yeah. So, because Emmy did not, I got the feeling or impression she didn't have that much money to spend. So. Right, of course not. Yeah. But you know, that's, that's the way it was, and it was just, um, the one thing I remember thinking about when I first came there was, at the State Archives, I was SP, what is the equivalent of what they call SPA positions on campus now. Mm -hmm. I was an archivist too. Mm -hmm. When I came to Jackson Library, I had a master's from Duke in history, but I did not have an MLS. Right. And I was made aware of it very quickly that I was not a professional. Just, uh, I can't believe that well, especially mm -hmm. at that time, it was more, it was not unusual for historians to be in those positions. So That's right. I mean, that was as a matter of fact, normal. the requirement at the State Archives, you will have a master's in history. Right. And they can get to UNCG and tough, tough, you don't count. But anyway, I got over it and stayed there and thought, well, I'm going to show you. Mm -hmm. So, but that, that's, you, that's one thing that I did not like. Uh, going back to the, the, when we were in the cage, sometimes Emmy, we would get maybe that many books on a shelf to be put, mm -hmm. reshelved. We would have to shift a whole range because we didn't have space. Right. So we would be involved in shifting. It was, it was amazing how, I don't think we even had a cat, uh, telephone up there. Right. Yeah, very small department, a lot of yeah. work to do for just a couple of people. And the amazing thing, you know, like I said, there were two full-time people, and when I left, I think there were either eight or nine, I can't remember. Right, it had changed a lot. And since you're talking about that, what, what year was it you retired or, or started? Did you do transitional retirement? No. Okay. No, I left in 10. Yeah, 2010, okay. Yeah, the department grew quite a bit. I was going to say, did they put in, does the elevator going up the third floor, is it smoother? <laughs> it's been redone and it's actually smaller than it used to be. I don't know if you remember, they, they did oh, a Oh, I remember the old one very yeah. well. It so was bumpy. Essentially, and yeah, I, I think it is a little smoother and a little more reliable. Well, actually, a lot more reliable. Actually, I told you I was pregnant. Christopher came a month early. Mm -hmm. And Emmy always said that it was the bumpy elevator. Oh, okay. that <laughs> <laughs> I always just thought I'd warn you. Yeah. <laughs> No, the no, interesting side about that is, did they at that time? Because my my mother, when she was a teacher, they wouldn't hold jobs for 
for people when they went on maternity leave. Like, you had to go back and reapply. Was that in play for no. your top job? Or? I'll, I'll ha this is what happened too. It's uh, like I said, Christopher came a month early. Mm -hmm. He was due June sixth. If you recognize that date, I did that deliberately. The doctor had said he was he's supposed to be either June fifth or June seventh, and I said, "Can we make it June 6th? <laughs> but anyway, he came May seventh. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure how the maternity leave was supposed to be uh, worked out, but at that time, everything went fine. When Christopher got here a month early, he was okay. But I had a kidney stone, mm. so that meant. As a matter of fact, they had put me in the hospital with the kidney stone whenever I went into labor with Christopher. Hmm. So I'd have surgery when Christopher was five weeks old for a kidney stone. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> and so then in August, they had told me that I was very fortunate. They knew that I, they knew what caused my kidney stone, and but I'd had more surgery. Mm -hmm. I flipped out. I said, no, 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 no. But anyway, I had to have more surgery in August. So this is my job was still yeah. out there. Yeah. To answer your question, no, I went back part time about October, and then the job was still there. Okay. So I didn't know that they would not hold positions. I just thought it was no. interesting. Yeah, I, that's just the way it was done. Is what she told me. No. And this was the public school system. Yeah. It's different than universities. Of well, course, yeah, but, but still, yeah. usually they follow pretty but much the same. But it does kind of tell you what's going on in society. Yeah, right. Uh, you know. Well, I think that most places at that time would not have hired a pregnant woman. Right. I was thinking about asking you about that too, but so well, did, they, I, did they know? Oh did yeah, you? Okay. I mean, yes, they knew that yeah. either that hour I was getting really like that. Well, yeah, they didn't know if they knew you. Oh no, so. I told them right yeah. away. You know, I had to. Right. But they didn't care. <laughs> the archives were more important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good. Can we talk about? Uh, you've talked a little bit about the kind of job you had when you got there. Do you want to talk about the the way your jobs changed over time? What your titles were? And oh, okay. That uh, I thought that was interesting. I, they hired me as a library assistant. That's the, all they get money for. Mm -hmm. That's the lowest on the totem pole at that time. I don't mm -hmm. know what, what it is now. Eventually, I was then promoted to be archivist one, and then. Archivist two, and then uh, Dars pushed it through to be um, professional, whatever faculty, library faculty, or whatever mm -hmm. it's called. I don't even right. know what they're called because I never, it never made that much difference to me, right. except it was nice to get the extra money. Mm -hmm. But there, there was but, a shift from SPA to EPA. I yes, guess, at the, the end, yeah. yeah. And in all honesty, now in the beginning, I was my time was sort of split between Emmy and Special Collections book and uh, archives. But the rest of the time, this it, it was the same job. Mm -hmm. Now, as I as more people joined us and did more of the work, I did very little of the processing, which I missed. Right. Yeah. And. Uh, then with a veterans project, more of that and more outreach in general for the archives. Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about the way students use the library during your time. Um, can you tell me how the changes in the way students use the library affected your job? Uh, you've already talked about outreach. You yeah, that. outreach, that was always, I was very fortunate. Well. Let's see, I, I left UNCG in 19, okay, 75, we moved to Charleston. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I was away, came back then part-time in 80, the spring of 82, I think it was. And then I came back full-time in the fall of 92. So there was a time there of uh, from 70, I left in 75, I was gone until part-time in 82, and then came back full-time in 92. Mm -hmm. And so you asked me about students. The main thing is, students did not use the archives mm -hmm. whenever I was there in the beginning. And they used the, the special collections very seldom. Mm -hmm. And that was the purpose, you know, that I saw that that had to be done. Emmy was not, she knew her, her topics, she knew, knew her books. But she wasn't the type that would really push people to come in and use them. And I realized right away you had to go out and drag people off the street. 
Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. So most of your researchers early on, of course, were uh, scholars or faculty or people who knew you had this certain book or this certain right, yeah. collection that were coming there right. for that, and that's right. what they were interested in. Okay, good. So what we had been talking about was changes in students and yeah, how it affected um, your job. I, I must admit, I was reading your questions. The way the li the way students use the library changed immensely, and um, the outreach for me, but then I also presentations, and that was for students, but it was for everyone else too. I remember it was around the hundredth anniversary, mm -hmm. which was very fortunate for me as the archivist, because people suddenly became interested in history. Yeah, you get all kinds I, of questions. I found out that um, people. Ten years away from the school, they still don't care about history. Twenty-five years, they're beginning. They want their kids to see where they went to school. Mm -hmm. And of course, by the time you, they've been out fifty years, oh, history's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Perspective again, <laughs> Perspective, right? Perspective, yeah. right? And so, with the eighteen ninety-two to nineteen ninety-two, that really opened doors. People wanted to learn the history about the school, and so I did. I made presentations everywhere mm -hmm. to anybody that would listen. And that really sort of helped me as far as getting the. I have the very. F we can we can take a shot of it. And okay. Put it in. If you the want. very first presentation I did on campus was for the Association of Women Faculty and Administrative Staff, and on February 18, 1991. Yeah. So that if you know that is a hundred years to the day whenever yeah. the the legislature uh, established the school. But, you know, I, and I can remember the reaction to the, I showed slides. Mm -hmm. People were just overwhelmed. It was just wonderful. Yeah, a lot of things they hadn't seen and didn't know about. Didn't right? know about, yeah, yeah. And so that, I have to give credit to the 100th anniversary for that. But the, the outreach by people learning to know that we had stuff that they could use for a paper. Faculty members didn't know it. Mm -hmm. right. And they even, I dare say, even today, a lot of faculty members do not know about the history of the school. Sure. Because I remember back with the, the 50th anniversary of the sit-ins, we kept hearing people were shocked that there were white women there. Right. Yeah. You know, and I had to, again, you had to educate them. You know? Yeah. Well, we actually have uh, students who come in. Uh, you know, we do a lot more with students now. Right. And we have classes that come in, and they, students, just like you say, there's different levels. Some of them, ho hopefully they've heard of the sit-ins, you know. <laughs> if they haven't, we tell them about that. Like you start there. They, they usually know about the four men from A&T. Right. But then many of them don't realize, one, it was a multi, it was had, didn't happen on one day and one time. It was a, right. had to do it several days over a period of time. Sit-ins were not a one-day thing. And then that students from WC right. went there and sat with them. Yeah. Right. Or, Participated in other ways if they didn't oh, yeah. sit there with them. So oh yeah, you, it was it was amazing, and you it doesn't matter how hard you work, you, there you're always going to find people. Oh, right. really? Yeah, which is great though oh, too. Yeah. I mean, it's not great that they don't know, but it's right. great that you're that making you a difference. Can explain yeah. it too. Yeah. But yeah, you know that was a, you know, you got down here. I did Jackson Library change during my career, and I put two things. I, first of all, I put money. I put dollar signs. Mm -hmm. It, the administration on campus became much more interested in raising money. Mm -hmm. I understand why, but it used to tick me off. But right. anyway, and then uh, the next thing I put Google. Mm -hmm. I mean, gosh, how did we do anything without Google? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to tell you a story about the use. So, you, well, I think she's one of your next questions about the cultural events that took place that I remember what sure, stand sure, out. Okay. That. That's fine. Let me show, tell you about the Woolworths women. Okay. Okay. This is around the 40th anniversary, so it'd been uh, 2000. We knew there, have, there were, there's always a story that there were the three women, Ann Dearsley Vernon, Marilyn Lott, and Jeannie Siemens. Well, I went back through the Carolinian, I mean, for that whole year of 1960. Mm -hmm. And Ann Dearsley had written a column, and she mentioned Betsy Toth had been with them. That was another UN, uh, WC woman. Mm -hmm. 
we had never, I had never heard of that. No one had heard of it. it was, and everyone kept saying there were only three. And I said, here's the Carolinian article written by Ann Deardsley, who was there. So I tried to track down Betsy Toff. Okay, remember, no Google, right. nothing. So I went to development people, see, did y'all, alumni people, anybody that who might have can track down Betsy Toff. No one could in the beginning. And back, like, then maybe two years later, I went back to them, and they were able to track down Betsy Toff. She lived very near Maryland Lot in Northern Virginia. Hmm. But anyway, what I'm getting around to, and so we wanted them, if possible, we thought it would be neat, we'd get them come to campus for that 40th anniversary. And so I tracked down, got Betsy's telephone number, dialed it. Hello, Betsy, this is Betty Carter. I'm at UNCG. It was just this long silence. I thought, oh no, she's gonna hang up on me. <laughs> and then she said, that's my alma mater. Yeah. I said, yep. I said, where have you been? <laughs> but anyway, she and Marilyn drove down in a snowstorm oh, wow. yeah. for that February 1st for the anniversary. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, those, those women were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And dear to say, I finally, she's the one that I interviewed in the, the machine. I think I told you what right. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway. But you got it anyway. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, it, the outreach, getting people, make sure they know what you got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want me to talk about also the. <sighs> you ready to move to that last question? Well, I was going to say the social cultural events. Okay. The other thing I'm not sure people know we, I did, I started doing. Each alumni class, as they come in to celebrate their 50th anniversary, know that that's a big deal. Of course, yeah. They would always come to the archive, to sh so I, I'd put everything relating to their years on campus. And so I worked with a lot of classes, probably mm -hmm. from the class of 45. The class of 50 gave us their class gift, came to the archives. Mm -hmm. And so on up to 55, classes of 55, maybe 56, I can't remember when we start. And so that meant I, a presentation was given at their reunion weekend somewhere on campus. So uh, that was a big event. We, again, we were covering the alumni, but we couldn't get to the students. Students weren't interested in history. That's, you right. know, you got to some, find yeah. something that grabs them rather than forget calling it history. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, so the other thing, you, did you know Dr. Bardoff by chance? I know who he is. I did you not know, know him. him. Yeah. You know, he, well, you don't know, but he, he came in the 40s, history department. And he was very interested in the history of the school, and so he, on alumni weekend, he would always be on campus, hmm. usually having some sort of program somewhere. Because when he, when the girls were in school, they loved him. They everyone loved Dr. Bardoff. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm telling you this, I can't remember what, what when it was, but he'd always come by and we'd talk, and you know when he would be on campus, particularly for alumni weekend. And I got this telephone call, and he told me, hey, this is Dick Bardoff. I said, you know, when you come and I want to see you. And he said, I won't be there. I said, why not? He said, my memory is not like it used to be. And I don't want to confuse the girls. I don't want to upset them by calling them the wrong name. Yeah. Well, I was in tears. Yeah. I'll never forget that telephone call. Yeah, for, especially for a history professor. Yeah. yeah, but he did not want, he was more concerned about upsetting the girls. Mm -hmm. Those 50, those 75 year old women, or 72 year old women. Mm -hmm. But, oh, <laughs> that was just, mm. okay, sorry. That's okay, no, that's great. Uh, do you have any stories or impressions that you want to tell me about um, the other librarians and archivists? Doris that you needs to be mentioned. Okay. Doris is the one, Dr. Jack, Dr. I keep calling him Dr. Jackson. Sorry. That's okay. Dr. Thompson, he knew we were there, but he really didn't didn't take a great interest in archives. He was more interested in books, and I understand sure. that's that's fine. Yeah. Doris. We used to tease her that she could have been an archivist. She understood what we were doing and tried to find money for us. Mm -hmm. She supported the Veterans Project more than anyone did. Mm -hmm. But she, and then of course, Doris endured the move of cataloging and acquisitions upstairs, took all sorts of criticism. Right. 
but yeah, she got historical okay. project, which of course started out as the Women Veterans Historical Project. Right. I was just going to see if you could. That's 1998, 19, not 1988. Oh, sorry. Just to make sure. I wish it were that old. Sorry. <laughs> I, I mean, we miss so many stories. We only s be thankful for what you have. Okay. So t how did that come about? Well, I don't, I have always been interested in World War II history. Mm -hmm. I've always been interested in world and European history more than I have American history. Women's history, and I'm very strong on that. Women are being forgotten, ignored, and you know, I can get off on a high horse on that, but anyway. Sure. But the World War II, I was never able to pull World War II and women together. And it was in the late 90s, I kept hearing about veterans projects. And guess what? They were always men. Of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and I remember that, um, I don't know whether they do this now, but they used to be, libraries in the system have these little monthly newsletters, and sometimes they would get passed to other libraries and be circulated among the staff. Mm -hmm. But it was, I think it was an NC State library newsletter mentioned that they were doing a veterans project. But of course, I mean, NC State, of course, it's men. Right. So I started reading and looking at veterans projects. Saw about the Whimsa in Washington, the Women's Memorial. And I thought, that's what we need to do. I can cover. Uh, women's history. Mm -hmm. Women from this school were joined up various units, but women's history, and I can pull my World War II interest in. Mm -hmm. And I just I probably talked to Herman about it. And I still remember. I mean, if it with the school's back, sure. I mean, it's history background. Right. And it wasn't easy to get it done because, again, though, someone supported me and I needed it. It was Doris. Right. So I right. wondered if, um, obviously, there would be WC alumni who, there were who, some. who served. Mm -hmm. Did you talk to them during the reunions events or did you uh, um, find any uh, source material from those events? Fortunately, to use for it? back in. I'm thinking it was 1992. Yeah. They had had, I'm not sure what they had done. It may have been, I was not aware of it. But the alumni house had asked that veterans, women veterans, send their uniforms to the alumni mm -hmm. house for an exhibit. Okay. It was waves, mainly. And so there was a little bit of knowledge about out there about it. But I was able, I can't remember where I got the mailing list, but I sent letters out. I'm thinking, okay, in er, by early 98, I was working on it. The luncheon, first luncheon was in November of 98. Okay. And the first interview was in January of 99. But um, I started working on trying to find people and I know Dara said, how did you get all these names? I said, if you get one name, that person's got a mailing list. Mm -hmm. Ask for their mailing list. Mm -hmm. So do you remember how many people came to that first luncheon? Even before you had interviews? Yeah, so. Beth Ann has, uh, she can probably tell you, I don't remember. It mm -hmm. was less than 100. Right. It was held in the alumni house. Mm -hmm. And the ladies love the alumni house. It's sure. so nice. Yeah. I can still remember, I made Ned Harrison, do you remember him? He worked, mm -hmm. He wrote for the News and Record, mm -hmm. Veterans mm -hmm. Column. But anyway, he spoke for us that day. Um, well, that's great that you got people to turn out even before the project oh, yes. had even... I know one of your questions yeah. said, was well, it difficult to get women veterans to talk? Yeah. No, yeah. they were ready to talk. Have you ever been a man in a group of probably 92, 90 women? I mean, yeah. can you imagine? I mean, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I remember I spoke that day and I, 
I took a gray box, a regular gray box with me to speak, and I said, it's your job to fill this box. Oh, and, you know, they looked at me like I was weird, but anyway. Mm -hmm. And I told them, you've got to save your history. No one else is going to do it. But right. yeah, we had like back, I think it was around 80 to 90 people at that first lunch. So it wasn't too hard to convince them that they were, I don't know. their stories were worth oh, hearing. And the, you see, they've always thought they were worth it, but they've always accepted, right. well, well, you know. Right. You know, we uh, even, when we started doing interviews, we wanted to interview the woman by herself. We never wanted her husband there. You mm -hmm. know why? Right. He would take over mm -hmm. because she would just sit there prim and proper and let him. Right. You feel like yelling different at time, him. Different time, different culture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As men had been used to this, you know. But you talk to men, every one of them was either been on Iwo Jima, Mount Suribachi, or they were on, at Omaha Beach. I mean. Yeah, right. But. Yeah, some of the women just typed letters, but those letters were necessary. Mm -hmm. sure. But, uh, you know, it, it was, administration, it wasn't that hard. Dar supported it. She believed in it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yes. Joan Glenn, who was the alumni, uh, whatever, director at that time, she mm -hmm. helped. She was great help. She helped me. I never, I mean, can you plan, imagine planning a luncheon for 80 people? Right. I was going to have a dinner. She says, no, no, you can't. You shouldn't have a dinner. Ladies that age do not like to get out at night. They're afraid they will fall. Yes, that's what we are afraid we'll fall at night now. <laughs> so, you know, she, it was just little, thing, little things like that, right. you know. She was so helpful. So everyone yeah, wanted to help. And, then, and I think everyone was shocked that it worked. Yeah. But it was the women. They were ready to talk, and they were ready to whatever they could do, they wanted done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So how did the project evolve over time? Well, adding more women, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. the, you wanted to have WC women, and you had to all, had to sort of just go with the flow. A lot of people thought it was just a WC project. No, you have to keep telling people it's the state right. of North Carolina it's project. a lot of education Yeah, a lot, exactly. And, uh, you know, uh, as you add more wars, we'll always have plenty of people to interview, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah. But um, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, it just, we still use, I think they're still using the basic questions that we had from the beginning, I'm not real sure, but that's one way you could always expand it. Mm -hmm. But um, they were never afraid to talk. But again, it's more outreach too. Mm -hmm getting people to understand that women contributed. And so now I've always listened whenever they're talking about historical military things, they all say men and women. Used to be, they didn't say women, right. they said men. Right. So I'm always pleased. I take credit for it. But, sure. but it's not, I mean, it's lots of credit, you know, I'm just being silly. Yeah. And so, how do you, can you describe how you think the project ensures that the story of women in war is being told? One thing is you mentioned you see things now women are mentioned along with side men. Yeah, you know, I think also this project, in my mind, is recognized because it's, first of all, it is based in an academic institution. Mm -hmm. Now remember, most of those World War II, not, well, not, I should say most, but a lot of the World War II women did not go to college before they went to the military. And they still view it like, you know, this is a college that's interested in what I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm so pleased for them because, yeah, we we're interested, you were important. Right. So, you know, it's a, um, an academic institution, I'm not really, I'm really big on paper, work, paper and words. I'm not really big on statues and whatever. Mm -hmm. The women seem to be happy, so I'm hoping that they approved how it's been preserved mm -hmm. and that it's been preserved accurately, so. Yeah. Well, the luncheon's one of my favorite events that we oh, do. Oh, I love to see yeah. the ladies. Yeah. And, and I miss And that's all. one of the things is that, that they all seem to really enjoy it and appreciate it. And, yeah, all my World War II ladies are gone there. Uh, yeah. I, I check the death list before I go to the luncheons. Right, yeah. But we have new veterans, we have younger veterans. Yes, we'll talk I know, but my I World know. War II ladies will always be, they were the grandmothers the I never had. Right, but the legacy continues. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. It is They're, interesting to... The, the new ones are just as tough as they were. Right, yeah. So. Yeah. Although they don't, 
I guess in some ways don't face some of the same challenges. So. Different challenges. Yeah. yeah. Different challenges, yeah. Yeah, it's still tough, I'm sure. So I need to ask you, how and when did the WVHP become the Betty H. Carter? I don't know when, when and I, I meant to look that up so I, I can That's look okay. it up. But, but you can talk about how. Herman's estate will be coming to the project, and he I said it'd be named for me. Yep. I was shocked. I didn't know anything that was going to happen. Herman has been wonderful for this project. He loved he loves the project as much as I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that Beth Ann doesn't love the project. It's just oh, no, of course not. Herman and I have a very close ownership or ownership of it. So he never talked to you about it before he did it. Just, mm -mm. Yeah. He just did it. Yeah. Yeah. So that was very, very nice of him. Yeah. Do you have a favorite story or oh, oral gosh. history? Oh gosh, just you say a story. Oh, I could start talking and not stop. Yeah. Let me tell you. Okay, maybe f about four women. Okay. Okay. It, I'll make it short, okay? So short That's as fine. Got plenty of time. One is Daphne Doster Mastriani. Mm -hmm. This she actually graduated from Women's College. Well, no, it was North Carolina College for Women's because she graduated. Okay. I think it was 27, and by then the name hadn't been changed again. Right. And so after she got her, and she had a degree in music, and after that she went and um, took training and became a registered nurse. Mm -hmm. At World War II, she joined the Army Nurse Corps. Station in Fiji. Mm -hmm. In Fiji, she met Joe Mastriani. He worked for the Red Cross. They became close friends. After the war, Joe went home to his family in New York. Daphne became a leader in public health nursing, eventually retiring in Charlotte. In 1992, Joe's wife died, and he got in touch with Daphne. Mm. So, he came to Charlotte to visit, and they were married. Wow. She had never married. Wow. She, when they married, she was 86. <laughs> they had only seven years together. Joe died in 99, and she died in 2000. Wow. Now, I know that's not earth shaking or yeah, but, but a it's very just, neat story. Yeah. It's just long? a. <laughs> if you ever have a chance to see girls, gar, Star Spangled Girls, right. Brenda's play, uh -huh. she taught Joe, there's a song about Joe in there. Okay. <laughs> and Herman told me the last time he went to see it, he sat there and cried because oh. he met Joe. I did, most of these people I only know through interviews. Right. I have met Daphne though. Okay. But I mean, can you imagine? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's one story. The other one is a little shorter. It's, it's about an army nurse, Mrs. Rivas, and I don't know whether she's alive or not. I meant to check that. But um, she was stationed in southern England, flew from England to the continent and bringing back plane loads of wounded men. And she told the story about one of the, um, if it's not the first one, the first plane loads coming back, she was trying to take care of everybody. And one of the wounded men started speaking German. And it was a German soldier that they had picked up by mm -hmm. mistake. Right. And the rest of the men on the plane were, were ready to kill him. Sure. And so, but they got that squared away. And so she said eventually they would have a plane load of German prisoners that, you know, hurt, wounded, that she had to take care of. And said so she had a really hard time doing it. Mm -hmm. That she, here she was saving the enemy. Right. But then she said she heard the story. One of the, one of the plane loads, the American soldier was telling her how rough it had been, how they had been in this battle, and they had a lot of wounded, and they didn't have a doctor. And then they said, heard this from a loudspeaker that this man speaking said, "I'm a German doctor. I know you don't have a doctor. We're going to call a ceasefire, and I'm coming over." Wow. Yeah. And she said that changed yeah. it. Yeah, that was amazing. And the other one I won't go into, but if you ever get a chance to read Mrs. Bain's interview. Bain, she was a wasp. Mm -hmm. She was Carson Bain, who was former mayor of Greensboro, his first wife. And she just died within the last year. She is hilarious telling about flying those planes. Mm -hmm. Those women were, I told her she was out of her mind. She said, yeah. That's amazing. Well, it takes a special type yeah. of person to do that, right? And finally, the last one. Um, 
is this is it personal for me um, in March 2003 I received an email from Dr. James Madison I always think that's interesting James Madison mm -hmm. he was he's a professor at Indiana University and uh, he had seen our website read some of our interview and he's a very interesting interview of Mary Matthews she'd served in the Red Cross in France and um, Professor Madison was writing a book about Elizabeth Richardson, another person who had served in the Red Cross, but she, and she was a native of Indiana. Elizabeth Richardson had been Mary's supervisor in the Red Cross, so that's the connection with us. Richardson was killed on a flight to Paris right after the war ended. But all, her family had saved all of her letters, her diaries and everything like that, and that's how Madison was getting his information and also like getting in touch with Mary Matthews. Mm -hmm. As I read his email, cold chills started running up down my spine. This was March when I got his email. Six months earlier in October 2002, I visited Omaha Beach and the cemetery that sits on the bluff overlooking the beach. I knew that among the 9,000 soldiers plus, 9,000 plus soldiers buried in that cemetery, there were four women. And I wanted to visit each of their graves. Mm -hmm. On the day that Christopher, my son, was with me and I were there, the superintendent of the cemetery wasn't there and his assistant could not find, the graves are coded by number, but he could only find one grave, woman's grave. But on that day we visited Elizabeth Richardson's grave. Mm. I thought I would never hear her name again. Wow. As a matter of fact, I came back and started using her this saying that I had visited her grave, and then I got Madison's email, and I just went, <laughs> and I told him. I said, let me tell you my story. Yeah. And he said, let me tell you my story. And he had sort of just happened upon her grave in the cemetery, too. Yeah. That's great. But, you know, those, uh, there's every, there's so many stories in those interviews. Mm -hmm. yeah. So many stories. And now they're preserved. That's yeah, great. they're there forever, yeah. I hope. Well, we're going to go to the conclusion section. Okay. If you're ready. Yeah. Uh, tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you. Well, I mean, you can see, I love history. I have found out that, you know, the winners write history so if you're in a war. But since there's so much reserved at UNCG, I think they're the winners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, uh, love history and I love it gets I am very strongly support you know the public record acts this the people who hold office need to understand that these records that they are creating are not personal records they belong to the people of North Carolina of this country whatever yeah. it very it's very North Carolina has a very strong public records act and um, so that's one you know I'm not sure that's helped preserve UNCG's records but hopefully it has yeah but um, I didn't go to school. A lot of people think I went to school at UNCG. I did not. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely place. I enjoyed my time there. Did I always agree? No. But who does? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that would be very unusual. But uh, it's uh, preserving history. And we've, I say we, this University Archives is good. They've done a good job. Mm -hmm. And of course, these women. The veterans preserving women's history is important too. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, you know, a large part of the, these interviews are done for the 125th anniversary of the university, and that's an excellent opportunity for f reflection, but um, it also helps to think about where we're heading in the future. So uh, I'm going to ask you, what do you think is the future of UNCG and where do you think it's going? In the <laughs> I deal with the past. I, don't do <laughs> I must enough. tell you, one of the things, uh, uh, one of the questions we ask the veterans, or we, or we used to, I know I asked Ann Dearson this, what do you see is the, I asked Ann, what is the uh, movement that, that you think is coming next? And mm -hmm. she said, you know, uh, the LGBT, uh, LG. Yeah, okay. You can either stop there, you can add Q, or you Q. can add several other letters. <laughs> yeah, it just depends. She said yeah. that was the yeah. thing that she saw coming in. Now this, you know, I, I've thought about this. I'm not really good at seeing the future, but I think UNCG is going to have to. 
well, to really fight to maintain where it is. I put down, there are no mountains near here. There are no beaches near here. That attracts people whether you like it or not. I mean, App State in Western Carolina, Wilmington, who's getting the big, you know, we're not unique, like School of the Arts. Mm -hmm. The flagship universities, I mean, State and Carolina, okay. And I even put ECU there because ECU covers a huge area of the state. Right. They were trying, during the early part of the century, they were trying to um, create what became East Carolina. McKeever fought it tooth and nail. Mm -hmm. He realized what, and McKeever died in 06, ECU came in 09. Yeah, right. But anyway, that's just, um, it's just, UNCG still had to fight. Mm -hmm. We don't have sports, and that's fine. I, I'm not a big sports person, except for Duke basketball. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you know, I don't know. Hopefully, the chancellor has some ideas on this. I'm not sure that the board of trustees are really the people that know what's ahead. Right. Uh, maybe the chancellor and some select faculty members retired and active. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I, I Fair mean, enough. It's a tough question. Yeah. It's just going to be interesting to see what people, how people answered it. 20, yeah, that would, and see what Maybe what someone happens. will figure it out. Yeah, see who the winner is. Uh, I don't have any more formal questions for you, but if there's anything at all that you'd like to talk about, expand on. I don't know, on, did you? It's, a, it's just wide open if you something else no, you want I to talk no about. No, I have no more. Like I said, you can always ask a zillion questions, so you, you, I thought you narrowed it down very well. Okay, thank you. Well, this has been great talking to you. Thanks for talking Well, thank to you for coming.